Sweet. So as that right. springs up, yeah. So I'm I'm talking about uh, blue team, but blue team from a design thinking lens. I've been doing a lot of uh, work in this area, a lot of research, a lot of conversations with folks that I, I mentor and, and collaborate with. And you know, not going to surprise anyone, what we're doing in security just uh, hasn't been working all that well. So I've got uh, a slightly different way to build a blue team, a slightly different way of thinking about defense uh, that I would say would uh, would be much better. We'll see if people agree. And for yeah. for context, before before he gets into it, so I can give the actual introduction, uh, he is an advisory CISO for Duo Security. Uh, he has been responsible for IT and IT security in the healthcare and financial services verticals. Uh, he's led advisory and assessment practices in cybersecurity consulting firms. So an excellent person to discuss these matters with us. And we're actually doing something a little different and special with this one. So uh, Wolfgang's the first part. We then have red team design right afterward with Cedric Owens. So uh, Wolfgang, if you could share how you're, uh, the two of you are going to be doing this. Yeah, no, I, I'm so glad you mentioned that, Bryson. So uh, you know, I'll be talking about the blue team perspective. But of course, uh, any anyone can tell you what's worse than no security, a false sense of security, which is exactly what you get if you're not testing these controls. And we've we've talked about pen testing forever. You know, the, the very first pen test was in the 70s. And they're like, I wonder if we could demonstrate that things could be broken into. And spoiler alert, they could. <laughs> and, uh, and we've done this for what decades now? Can you break in? Oh yeah, you broke in. Okay, great. Uh, we'll we'll uh, we'll become more compliant next time. What's really fascinating with what Cedric's going to talk about is moving from that very reactive approach to partnering the red team with the blue team in a way that can give us some assurance that what we're doing actually is working. Cool. So very excited out. for it. So with that, should I take it away? Is there any any other setup? Great. Also, the floor is yours. <laughs> I've got, thank you so much. I've got chat up. Um, so as uh, as we go through here, you know, folks that are on the line. Feel free to uh, throw questions in, and I will answer as I can. Um, as already mentioned, I am with Duo Security. I'm an advisory CISO there. And for the longest time, you know, I've uh, I've been very excited and very proud to take the Tron approach, right? I I fight for the user, which sounds good. I think it sounds good. Um, maybe you agree, maybe you disagree. However, the reality is is that uh, those of us fighting for the user haven't necessarily done the best job of it. I think I would uh, be remiss if I didn't admit that I spent about 10 years solving the wrong problem. I say, you know what? We need to build things like a castle. Secure organizations like a castle, that's what we should do. Defense in depth, all these layers. And uh, eh, sounds sounds good, except for when you realize that castles took two, three decades to build, consumed around 40% of the, the income, the revenue of the kingdom. Not exactly a good model for cybersecurity when we have to put up something now. See also during the pandemic when we all scrambled. Uh, and we have to do something with point, you know, percent of the IT budget, let alone the revenue of the company. But maybe that's not a good approach. Uh, another approach that we all thought about is, you know, if we just speak the language of the business, right? The business is speaking uh, cybersecurity. If we just speak the language of the business, we will get through to them and they will listen to us and they will go, you are right. We should address these risks, have some money, go forth and do. Uh, the reality is that that hasn't paid off either. Uh, in part, I think we got took a very technical domain, cybersecurity, and went ah, business is talking about risk. Okay, cool. We'll talk about risk because you know we're too too technical. And then immediately, what do we do? We make it incredibly technical with fair and active, and uh, let's talk about SLE and ARE and ARO. And again, we got that glazed over look. The other thing is intriguing about risk management is, uh, and I, I think about this as cheeseburger risk management, right? We we all know you shouldn't eat the cheeseburger. The cheeseburger's so tasty. <laughs> and so you eat the cheeseburgers until you have a heart attack. Uh, and then, then hey, no, we're, we're getting healthy now. We've, we've been breached. We, we've seen the light. We're going to double down for a year, maybe two if we're lucky. And then we're right back to our bad habits. 
So I'm not entirely sure that risk management has been a good approach for blue team in protecting the user either. So we don't, okay, fine. What we need to do, what we need to do is just tell users what to think, right? If we just give them the information, they would uh, they will go forth and secure things. Very optimistic, back to risk management. We've seen how well that works in, in health. Just tell people not to eat cheeseburgers, it's cool. <laughs> or the pandemic has given us so many different examples. Uh, just get, make sure that they got an awareness. Yeah, that, that worked really well for social distancing and masks. Um, but somehow we think this will work in security, right? If we just create a culture, if we just share the knowledge so they know what to do, things will get better. Spoiler alert, it hasn't. Part of the in interesting thing about uh, culture is there's so much more to it than just saying, hey, here's something good to do. So we we fight for the user, but of course, at the same time, we've got so many different examples of blaming the user for bad security. And I would argue it's not the user's fault. We'll get more into that later. But um, along this path, as I've been trying to figure out different ways to, to uh, improve how the blue team is gone, I really need help. I really need help on this. So I'm gonna have a couple slides throughout this talk where I'm asking for help. Here's one example. If you've got a good like Super Dave story, right? Uh, where, where Dave or Denise, it doesn't matter, the gender really doesn't matter, the person. But if you got a good user story where they've saved the day, please share that with me. I'm I'm collecting those and I want to, uh, to do something with it. But let's talk about how I've been describing the problem today. First off, in terms of, of Blue Team and in terms of IT, we're, we're creating experiences all the time. And we don't necessarily think about it that way. If I uh, if I stand up um, the ability for a user to go ahead and use telephony for multi-factor, sounds good. What experience have we just enabled for the criminals? Seeing massive amounts of phone scam fraud across all sorts of MFA vendors for the past couple of years, uh, because when we did this, we thought only about the user experience. Conversely, if I go, you know what, I am going to, I'm going to create this fantastic logging and I'm going to make sure that, uh, you know, we've got full visibility and all this data so that we can react and that we've got the ability to do good instant response, and yada, 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 right? Good, good blue team sec ops. We don't necessarily think about the experience that creates for the workforce who now views us as big brother. And wait a minute, how do you know what I was browsing? <laughs> what do you mean you're monitoring all my clicks? So anything we do in terms of security is creating experience. Now, what's fascinating about this from a behavioral economics perspective is we can, we can actually pivot and control two different points on the experiences we create. And this will become more important as we talk about both usability and defensibility. Um, we can we can pivot on the paths they take, right? What is the step-by-step -step approach that someone's doing to, to complete work or step-by-step -step approach that some criminal is doing to break into our networks? Uh, or we can think about the choices we, they make. Um, and this last one can really get me, uh, you know, I've got like six different multi-factor authenticators. I got three different cloud services. Uh, I got to remember my VPNing or connecting directly. Um, we've got several different document stores and I never seem to be on the right one, right? I Oh, I need the doc and I think it needs the VPN and I think it's over here, but really it was SharePoint, no, wait a minute, it's Google Docs, no, wait a minute, it's this other thing. And do I have the right thing? Who knows, right? Choices that people make. So there's some ways from a defensive perspective we can think about this. We can think about the number of steps uh, the familiarity of each step. If you've seen past talks, you've, you've heard me talk about when work looks like work, work gets done. This is what I'm talking about with familiarity. Um, so critical if you're trying to get adoption for a new control, if you're trying to get um, you know, your IT team to run some tests for you. I remember early days I had uh, an IT team. I'm like, oh yeah, just you know, fire up Kali and run these tests. And they're like, oh, those are hacker tools. We're exposing our network. Like, all right. Um, will you use your scheduler to run this simple PowerShell script? Oh, yeah. We use PowerShell to admin all the time. Okay, good. Thank you. Right? The familiarity often determines how easy or difficult it is to follow that path. 
And then the friction, we talked way too much about friction, but adding friction, removing friction, how difficult is it to go from step to step? On the choices side, choice architecture and nudges as a whole domain, which could be explored in way greater detail than a half hour talk, but things like the number of choices, predictability of each choice. So I was doing a uh, pen test and uh, my guy was doing the scam and he kept getting kicked out. And every time he would like follow his normal predictable path, like I chose this, I chose that, I chose this, he would run into a roadblock. And what it was, and it was so bloody clever of the defense team to, to build this in. Uh, what it was, was they were looking for 404s, they were looking for 500. So if there's a server error or a missing page, they knew, hey, someone's, someone's scanning. And when that happened, they would throw up some decoys or they would block the session for several minutes. And what would ordinarily be like an hour worth of effort to enumerate and figure out the site that we're you know getting into turned into uh, my my pen tester who was hands on the keyboard basically working over the weekend and just ah so frustrated which as a defender oh, I love that feeling <laughs> and finally the cognitive load right how much are requiring them to think about when they're making these choices these are some of the pivot points that uh, we can think about on each individual step and it's those individual pieces that really matter right having fewer steps when we're trying to defend easier move from step to step or conversely increasing and adding things up you know adam showstack once had this quote from the book the new school of information security which is an old book about the new school but you should definitely read it if you haven't uh, where he said hey amateurs study cryptography and professionals study economics Love that quote at the time. Why? Because as much as I like, you know, encryption standards and data protection and the math, just the math kills me. So I love that quote. I would argue, you know, in today's era when we're doing blue team design and blue team thinking, we really need to be thinking more about behavior economics, which is those paths, those choices, what causes people to make good decisions, what causes people to adopt the controls, right? I would say professionals study behavior economics with um, with apologies to Showstack. Knowing, of course, I think Showstack might have got this from somewhere else. <laughs> but first step I, and thing I would leave you with is this idea of behavior economics choices and steps as applied to defense and offense. And as a uh, as a help wanted, if you are or know someone who's a student in organizational psych who's working on a capstone project, or a thesis who wants to collaborate, please get in touch. I'm talking to a few folks right now, and we're really finding some intriguing ways to increase security in ways that are uh, likable by users, that people enjoy. So for example, um, FIDO2 with passwordless. No password, easy to get in, simple. Uh, on the back end, increase the security in ways that are transparent and don't add steps or friction to users. How do you do that? Well, you do that by applying risk analytics. Um, looking at the context and conditions of the authentication, you get the idea. So we can do some really cool things in the realm of behavior psych and behavior economics. If you or someone you love is suffering in one, I mean, <laughs> it's in one of these programs, send them my way. We'd be happy to uh, to collaborate. But my my main point in this first section is this: perhaps the the real security is the the steps that we take out, right? The bricks we eat along the way. Uh, the the areas where we reduce what we ask of our users and in conjunction drive up adoption and drive up using the controls that we're providing. All right, so that's my 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 premise of how to define the problem of blue team security these days. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the definition of uh, design thinking. It all goes back to, to this guy. This is the original computer mouse, Douglas Engelbart's computer mouse, Douglas Engelbart of the mother of all demos, where he invented so many different things in, in computers. He actually wasn't too mechanically inclined, I'm told. This uh, this device was manufactured for him uh, <laughs> with a whittling knife. As you can see, it's carved out of wood. So freaking cool what uh, early technologists were doing. But Engelbart thought of the mouse as being a precision instrument. He thought of the mouse as being like music. 
And what that led to was a six month course in using the mouse. Later versions look like the one on the left. The one on the right is actually a chord structure. Again, his mental frame, right, his metaphor was uh, make things look like a musical instrument and, and people will play. And it required six months for early students working with Engelbart to master these tools to control the early computers. So of course Xerox sees this and they're like, you know, we like the mouse, not too groovy on the whole uh, chord system, not really working for me. <laughs> In 1972, Xerox Park comes out with this version of the mouse. Uh, this guy, very expensive, Xerox's version was a precision engineering instrument. You can see it's got a medical trackball. It's easily to disassemble. They had a maintenance team, an engineering maintenance team that will go around and service these things, open them up, clean them, realign them, make sure that they went through diagnostic, put them back together on a weekly basis. Can you imagine on modern IT if we had to go around and check everyone's mouse every week? So of course that gets to the, the Apple mouse and Steve Jobs is oftentimes credited for this. It was actually a company called IDEO that uh, did the work. Or originally, the designers turned into a company called IDEO that did the original work uh, on the uh, the Apple Mouse. So when they did this, they spent a ton of time looking at how people were using the mouse uh, or would use it, right? Not as a musical instrument, but actually how people thought. They spent a ton of time following a design thinking process where they empathized, they did field research, they figured out what the click should be. They figured out what the weight should be. They figured out where it was sticking, where it wasn't. And uh, and they followed this approach to define a bunch of different prototypes and come up with a, a new and better way of controlling the computer. Um, there's uh, This has now been codified in IDEO's design thinking process. I actually have this poster on my wall over there, which you guys can't see, but on the wall of my study. I want you to compare and contrast that with ITIL which so many of us follow. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna catalog, we're gonna do an SLA, we're gonna make sure we got capacity. At some point in time, we'll bring in security and they'll thumbs up at the last minute. Uh, you know, they, you think about how a lot of these services are brought together. They end up being very expensive. They end up having a lot of steps, a lot of complexity for the users, which is why people opt out. I was having a conversation around uh, around WebEx and, and Zoom, right? Having these meetings. And like, yeah, we're, our concern is, you know, people might share information. Oh, that's about concern. Yeah, so we're blocking all of it and we're turning off chat and we're turning off file share. And we're making sure, I'm like, wait, wait a minute. You gotta go through four steps and use a custom browser to launch your web meetings? Like, yeah, yeah, because it's secure. Groovy. Um, Where's the empathy in that side, right? And what about the cost? If you look at the the Apple mouse, uh, it was $25 compared to the Xerox mouse, which is 400. It's about three times inflation. So about $75 in today's uh, math as opposed to what would be around 1200. And then on the um, on the time side, you'll watch early Steve Jobs like, oh, you could sit down and use this in minutes. And then today it's like, of course you could. You sit down and use a computer, what's it? But think about Engelbart again, right? Think about that IT engineering approach that we have now brought into security. Um, there was a six month course compared to six minutes, incredibly different way of doing things. The way we get there, I believe, in terms of setting up blue team defenses is having the business SME and having the security SME is great, Security SME, highly focused on security. Business SME, highly focused on business, right? So your financial services person and the, the person in charge of um, compliance for that process. Of course, we know today that we need security champions, someone within the business who cares about security, someone in the business who uh, is advocating for what the process should be. I would argue too, and this is the part that oftentimes gets overlooked, we also need a security advocate. So if we've got a, a blue team of 50 people and we've got a business unit of 50 people, we've got two or three uh, security champions that we're uh, you know, encouraging and coaching and managing up. And then we also have a security advocate that works to understand that business unit. And what are the security advocate and champion do? They do what we almost never do in security. They find the bricks that can be eaten. They find... <laughs> the types of controls 
that can be simplified or removed so that the business can be more effective, so that we can reduce friction, so we can encourage uh, adoption of controls. It's that last mile of concern. So my, uh, my call to action here, if anyone wants to help me, is I'm looking for stories of design thinking, specifically security empathy. Uh, empathy is not something that, uh, from an engineering perspective, as a discipline, as a field, we particularly excel at today. All right, point three, let's talk about how this looks. Let's suppose you are, your, your business functional area is uh, development uh, and uh, you know your security team cares about AppSec, orchestrating and putting in place telemetry and control so the DevOps process is working right. You get the idea. So one day, you know, the security team sitting next to the DevOps team, they overhear a developer. Developer's like, look, we got the sprint coming up. Before we, we do our stand up, I'm going to go just take a walk around the building. And uh, a team is like, yeah, it sounds good, but isn't, isn't it supposed to rain? And that's, that's when security jumps into action, right? We're like, yes, we've got this. We've got you. We want something that will keep rain off you. We want something that won't blow away. What if someone drops? something off the roof. I saw an article the other day on Reddit where, right? And that is how we end up with controls that look like this. Here, carry this around. You'll be fine. It'll be, it'll be fine. Just just go. Yeah, um, trust me. Uh, by the way, this is from The Uncomfortable, so shout out to them. When we think about that path, what we're looking at is making uh, use of behavior or journey map. Here's the, the process the users follow. Um, figuring out the controls we need to apply to that process. And then again, working to reduce steps, working to reduce choices, working to simplify. From the red team perspective, we wanna do something a little bit opposite. Um, threat modeling to figure out the path that they're gonna take, um, but then figuring out the tactics and mapping those. MITRE attack framework is the way to do this. Cedric will be going to this a little bit more uh, in depth. And then we're going to reverse those things, right? Because we want users to opt in. We want criminals to opt out. So we're going to increase steps. Uh, we're going to increase choices. We're going to complicate the process. And we're going to do that in a way that frustrates the red team if we're successful, because that is our, our goal, is to definitely frustrate the criminals. Maybe not frustrate the red team, but you see what I mean. We want to, we want to get them to drop off and, and quit. Behind the scenes, from a behavior economics perspective, we're looking at the behavior we want to get. We're looking at the barriers that get in the way of that behavior and the benefits. And we want to clarify those uh, behaviors. We want to reduce barriers for our, our uh, users. We want to amplify the benefits. Otherwise, of course, they just don't do what we want to do. Think about every time you've had multi-factor and they've ignored it. Ignored it. Think about every time you had a password policy and they just kept changing the year. Think about every time you've said don't click on links and they just keep clicking on links, right? It's just the way it works. So by figuring out the behaviors we need and what those barriers are with a security champion and advocate working together, we can put in place a process. And of course it won't always work. There's a lot of different ways it can it can fail. Um, there's a, a great paper on this, uh, learning from behavior challenges that fail, if you want to read more, we can start categorizing and figuring out why things aren't, aren't going the right way. And there's a number of reasons for that. It could be they don't know. Again, I, I think awareness is the first step. It's not action, but it's a start. Uh, it could be the design's just frustrating or the culture's against them. I've been in cases where organizations were going through a merger and trying to, to deal with insider threat scenarios in that. Poof. Could be investments, maybe need more people or more time, and it could just be incentives. DevOps needs to put out code and security team is slowing them down. We can start looking at those four to troubleshoot the taxonomy of, why, of behavior change and figure out what and why it went wrong. And from there, we can work with security and introduce steps, introduce the bricks. Uh, worst case, something that stops the user, a little bit better if it slows the user. My favorite, of course, is invisible or even speeds up the user. Um, I had an entire exploration and series called Securing Without Slowing. We found a number of interesting cases where security actually made the users go faster by removing things, by simplifying things. Plenty of ways to do it. The reason for this, of course, is from, from a blue team perspective that the more creative our users are, 
the more likely they are to work around us and open up holes. And from a blue team perspective, the reason for this is the better we can understand the human side of the red teamer or the adversary, the better we can put in place steps that go ahead and intersect with what they're gonna do and add those steps. Verizon Data Breach Report actually has a, a great set of data on this that shows that if you get the steps uh, to around 10 or more, that the success of the attack actually drops in half. So we know adding steps can really be impactful. From the blue team perspective, we're thinking about ways that uh, we can enable access and harden things, uh, applying use cases approaches, and running those use cases down to our SOC so we can have better product security, better Intel, better IT security. Having basically a common set of blue team use cases that we're enabling and talking about in a common way. From a red team perspective, we obviously you want to communicate those to the red team, have them be tested, have it be proven, make sure it actually works. All the things Cedric's going to talk about because the greatest security is, is meaningless if it's just a false sense of security. Uh, I had a, a client I was working with that was really impressed with the security plans. So it was working great. They said very few false positives. They said we almost never have to worry about it. They said, uh, and as we got closer and closer and actually tested it, it turned out the reason it had so few false positives was that the intrusion system was actually unplugged. <laughs> it was still in the management network, but it wasn't monitoring a damn thing. So as you might imagine, that uh, that was not an effective control and not something that would have been necessarily caught without someone doing some adversarial emulation. So as, uh, as we're thinking about ways to, to get engaged with this, I am working uh, with a, a couple of mentees doing some coaching on taking this approach to the environment, what works, what doesn't. If you're interested in that, feel free to reach out. All right, in our last couple of minutes together, number four, the conclusion, bringing this all together. Obviously, every time someone picks up a mouse, they're making a choice to strengthen or lessen our security. We hope they choose wisely. We hope to be protecting the user and fighting for the user. It's very difficult to ha get done if we don't have visibility into the friction points, what's working, what's not. Uh, it's very difficult to be done if we don't have the empathy, right? And in those scenarios, it's where you end up with a six month mouse that costs several thousands of dollars. But this approach is still early. This approach is still something that uh, I'm playing with and trying to figure out the best way to, to describe it, to build a process around it. And, uh, you know, I think back to the early days of threat modeling, same thing. We were finding our way in the dark till it made sense. I think about early, you know, TTPs, same thing, finding our way in the dark until we had the MITRE attack framework. But sometimes you just need to start <laughs> and go from there. There's a, a great story, uh, another legend in IDEO, again, IDEO being the company behind the mouse, many other design decisions and design thinking. And uh, in the 1970s, there's this uh, gentleman, uh, Mogridge was his name. He was you know, going back and forth from meetings, going back and forth up and down across Silicon Valley. He had this beat up old briefcase. And it was heavy, you could tell it was heavy. And in between meetings, he would open it up and rearrange the parts inside. And uh, and what he was doing was trying to figure out how to make a computer portable. So he had put all the key components in, in this briefcase and was working through the idea. And uh, eventually, 1982, the Grid Compass came out. 1982, the Grid Compass was released as the first portable device based on his designs. And it's a legacy to this day, as I'm presenting to you right now, that all our computers open like this briefcase, right? Why? Because in early days, that was the insight. Ah, if we just Put the screen here, the keyboard there, the pods there, it'll work. So I've got a lot of faith in prototyping and figuring these things out. So please do feel free to reach out to me as we go through this process. But, uh, you know, it is imperative that we think about it from an adversarial lens. Uh, here's, here's one tip. If you get nothing else out of this talk, remember this. If you want to win uh, rock, paper, scissors, here's how you do it. 
there's uh, some threat intel we have. Uh, if you win, winners tend to repeat a session. So if they go rock, rock, and they won with that, they're going to do rock next time, almost always. If they lose, they rotate rock, paper, scissors. So if you lost with a rock, most likely your adversary is going to go with uh, paper next, rock, paper, scissors. Uh, so you can win by having that intel, right? And it seems like that's exactly the thing that you need to do. Until you talk to the red team, they're like, yeah, so what's cool is, did you know if you spun paper fast enough, you could actually cut the scissors and you know, it just completely turns things on its head, right? This idea that we had great intel, we knew exactly what to do, goes out the window the minute you get some creative red teamers and they're doing some creative things. So please do stay tuned for Cedric's talk coming up next on building a effective red team where he's gonna talk about the complement to this, which is how you build a team that can test, hammer away at things and help find areas that we've overlooked and find areas where we can add controls without adding friction or overhead to our end users. Um, with that, I'll take any questions. I know I'm at the bottom of the hour. We got just a few minutes. So if anyone has anything they wanna pop in chat or questions, feel free. And otherwise, thanks so much for joining. I hope you guys are having a great GrimCon. Thank you so much. That was I great. I had no idea we were going to learn so much about mice. <laughs> it, there, what about cicadas, Dave? I have a whole oh, talk on cicadas coming up. Really? Uh, we can go back to mice. I, I, I prefer this topic, actually. <laughs> oh, I want to hear about the cicadas. Ooh, ooh, do you, though? Do we want to hear about this? We'll hear a lot from the cicadas in May, right? So we don't need any, any more. True story. Why, why borrow trouble early? Absolutely. So something I was not expecting in the talk, and of course it makes sense when you're really thinking about design, is that empathy is understanding somebody else's experience. And that can tie into anything from uh, the emotional components, which were part of our keynote, all the way to professional components, right? Like, what do users experience and why? And I think that's something that is a particular challenge to security, because inherently, we're a blocking function, both yes. technically and process-wise. Yeah, and there, there's a couple of things there, right? One is, how do you develop empathy? Uh, my my wife does uh, consulting and she used to teach doctors and she would tell them, yeah, no, you don't need to be empathetic. I get it. You know, she'd be talking to some like Dr. Cox off of Scrubs character. It's like just you just need to do these three things to pretend <laughs> to, to build the connection. I hope we don't have to get to that, but I do realize that empathy in itself can be hard. The second thing is empathy at scale is pretty much impossible which is why I think we really need advocates and champions. It's really easy for us to go, oh, I, I helped this one person at work that I liked. It's very hard to think about, oh, this business unit of a thousand people across the pond needs these four things. What do I need to do to help them? We really need to bring the voice of the person who's experiencing it and listen to them to come up with security uh, that uh, is effective, but not weighing them down or getting in the way. Did medieval castles really take 40% of the property of the like local areas revenue. I don't even know how you would measure the revenue. It's the, it's the feudal system. Yes, absolutely. It's a feudal system. Um, and now we can argue is, you know, our country is spending that percentage of revenue today. There can be some arguments and some corollaries there, but there's a reason why no one builds castles anymore. There's a reason why they went out of fashion is because they're very expensive, took way too long and we're not responsive to uh, to threats. I thought the reason was just thought, pure gunpowder. Yeah, exactly. Put some gunpowder on and some, some cavalry, and uh, um, all of a sudden you don't have something that can be responsive. Maybe that is the future of the security market. On, on the subject of castles and evolving uh, defenses, in Nuremberg, the the castle there has a has a wall around it that comes off at odd angles just the constantly changing angles around it because uh that actually made it harder to scale up the wall than rather than having one flat flat wall there's there's a lot of there there's a lot of room for metaphor there to our to our current well, vocation 
Absolutely. The the making it hard to scale. The the um, the windows too that were very hard to shoot arrows in, but allowed for a lot of view out. You know, great metaphor there in terms of doing orchestration and, and telemetry on endpoints. Cool. Well, I thought it was a really good presentation. I I really enjoyed the uh, the cleanliness of your presentation. I guess in a way, I thought it was like, you know, like it. Some of these ideas are pretty complex at some level, and you presented them really well. Um, and if people have further questions for you, I assume they annoy you in the Discord. Is that correct? Yeah, annoy annoy me in the Discord or reach out to my website. Perfect.